Father, we thank you. Uh, I thank you, Jesus Christ, for this night, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for everything you're doing, Father, in our lives. Everything, Jesus, you're just so good, Lord. We thank you for allowing us to see another day of life. Uh, thank you for allowing us to be a participant of what you're going to do in 2024. We thank you, Jesus, for our day. We thank you we've made it through a majority of the week, Lord, that, Lord, that we're just be that much more ready for Sunday to praise you and worship you and and just display how much we love you, Father, and just keep on pushing and growing, Lord. I know some people may have had some rough weeks at work, maybe some rough weeks, and just in general, Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would remove all stress, that you would remove, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, um, that you would remove every bit of anxiety, every bit of uh, impatience. I pray that you would remove every bit of frustration that anybody may be feeling on this night, just maybe saying, man, this year doesn't feel like it's starting too good. Lord, we just pray, Lord, that you would just take that all away, Lord, that they would cast it on to you, Jesus, because you care about them. And they would just focus on tonight's Bible study, be built up, be encouraged, be filled with wisdom, be filled with more of your spirit, be filled more with your anointing and your power and your love and authority, Lord, that we continue to take on the posture of just keeping our foot on the devil's neck and just continuing to serve you, Lord, knowing that serving you is not in vain, pursuing you is not in vain, living holy is not in vain, Lord. Everything in you has its reward. So we thank you, Jesus. Be glorified tonight. Teach us and speak to us in the mighty name of uh, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hey, man, guys, let's get on tonight's Bible study. <clears throat> I'm excited. We're going to continue on... Um, we're reading the book of Genesis. Uh, we're gonna. We've been. We're we're almost there, guys. Let me see. We're in Genesis thirty-two. We got. We got about uh, about eighteen more chapters, but we're getting through it quick. Amen. As soon as we're done with Genesis, we're gonna get into some other teachings. We're gonna get into Timothy. I also, want to teach on 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 prophecy, on how to operate in the prophetic how to operate with word of knowledge, how to be able to discern spirits, but I'm going to go deep. I gave a class about it before on YouTube. So if you guys are interested in that, you can go look on YouTube. Uh, I, I went pretty much pretty basic on certain things, but this time I'm going to go a lot deeper, how to operate, because I believe it's time uh, for many of you to start really operating in, in some gifts um, and uh, having a good solid foundation and have... <sighs> Being very equipped, amen. One a dangerous thing is to operate in the anointing of God uh, and not being equipped. You want to be equipped. You want to um, know what you're doing, amen, so you don't have to be scared as you're doing it or doubting if it's from the Lord or not. But So let's get through Genesis quick, amen. So we're going to continue on Genesis chapter 32. Uh, we last left off where uh, Jacob uh, was fleeing his uncle. Uh, his uncle was doing him dirty. <laughs> uh, he was scamming him and abusing of him, but he ends up leaving his uncles where he was living. He leaves with his wives. He leaves with his children. And now he's headed back to the land that um, God told him to go back to where his brother Esau is at. And I think it's real good that we just kind of reflect where we left off. Because, you know, quote unquote, Esau is technically his brother, but yet it's his enemy because <laughs> Jacob pulled some fast ones on him, took his birthright, took his blessing, took a lot of things. So he kind of had an enemy within a family member. And now he has to go back. And because God told him, listen, I have a land for you, your fa your family, your inheritance, your children. Um but now he's about to deal with some intimidation and resistance. And, and, and I like that we're going to touch on this today because um, how many here are on here tonight? You've been dealing with some resistance and maybe intimidation tactics from the enemy um, regarding an area of your life that you're really believing God for, trusting God for, for some certain changes for some certain blessings, maybe a breakthrough or, a, you know, something, you know, that you're, you're just really believing God to see something change and be a difference. And maybe lately you're just a little discouraged, maybe a little overwhelmed and dealing with some resistance and some intimidation factors from the enemy. 
if that's you, just want to say amen. Just so you, I know that you're you're going through that, so I can go deep into that. Um, because I I I put this on Facebook the other day. When God gives you a promise, when God gives you a vision, when God is going to do something in your life and he He speaks something over your life, be prepared to deal with resistance. No vision comes with no resistance. No, no promise comes with no intimidation tactics from the enemy. Why? Because the enemy is not going to let that slide. He knows God is going to do something great. He knows he's going to bless you. He knows he's going to bring fulfillment. So what does he do? He brings intimidation tactics. He 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 causes you to uh, uh, doubt, be discouraged, get overwhelmed, get frustrated, get impatient. So that way you abandon mission and you put yourself further than where you should have been. Because I, if you notice, that always happens when you're you're just close. You're close to the blessing, and the uh, enemy knows you're getting closer. You're getting closer. So he'll cause something to intimidate you, scare you, um, resist you. To push you back, so you, so every time, and I believe this happens to a lot of you guys. This is your, your promise, your destiny. You get, you get close, you get close, you get close, you get close. Then the enemy discourages you, attacks you, intimidates you. Boom, and you take some steps back. You try again, 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 again. You get close, and then you go back. You get close, you get close, and then every year this is happening to a lot of you guys. You get close, you get fired up, you get excited, you're going to church, you get prayer, you get overwhelmed, and then you go back. Oh, let me try again. I'm going to pray. I'm going to fast. I'm going to church. I'm serving. I'm trying. Boom, get discouraged again. Boom, you look at your circumstances. Boom, you look at what things look like. You get doubt. You get fear. You get intimidated. Now you go back. So you're just like this, like this, and you never get to where you need to be with Christ. How many can say amen? How many are you there tonight? You let intimidation, uh, the intimidating factors of the enemy just, you know, because what happens when something doesn't look like it's going the way it should. We stop praying. We don't pray as much. We don't really believe as much. We're just kind of going with the flow and we just kind of become miserable and complacent and we start becoming lazy and we're like, man, I knew not to believe. I know some of you guys on here, you're like, man, I knew just not to get so excited because I just get end up getting disappointed. And, you know, God keeps saying he's going to do this, but I don't really see it happen. So I'm just not going to believe for anything. Whatever happens, happens because I don't want to be disappointed. Right. And the enemy knows this because disappointment, you know what it means? The Bible says that um, hope deferred maketh the heart sick. That means when your hope is deferred, what does it mean to defer? It goes in a different direction. It causes the heart to get sick. What does it mean the heart gets sick? You get sad. You get desperate. You get anxious. You get depressed. You get lonely. You get all, you feel like a failure. You feel like, so hope deferred maketh the heart sick. So what does the enemy try to do? He tries to steal your hope. And so we're going to encourage you tonight. We're going to let the devil know tonight. His intimidation tactics not going to work <laughs> because we're going to be tactical Christians tonight, right? So the devil's tactics do not work. How many could say, man, how many could write that in the chat? We're not going to let the devil's intimidation tactics work tonight. Amen. I'll tell you this much. Every time God has spoken something over me, and promise me something and I, or I heard the Lord tell me something you better believe everything he tells me right after everything comes against the thing that he told me <laughs> imagine that God tells you something and then the exact opposite starts to happen how, how many how many ever been that like you're believing God for something you're getting excited about something from the Lord and his word and his promise, and you're getting your hopes up. And then the exact opposite starts to happen. That's a, a some, an area we need to fix where we're like, you know what? I'm not going to level. I'm not going to let the devil do that to me again. I'm not going to let him take my hope because hope deferred maketh the heart sick. I will not let the devil make my heart sick. He will not defer my hope. Amen. So Genesis chapter 32, verse one. Now we're dealing with Jacob. He's got to go deal with his brother. He's got to go back to the land that God said, go back. This is for you. And it says here, verse one, then as Jacob went on his way, the angels of God met him to reassure and protect him. 
<laughs> so he's going back to where God has told them. And God, look at the beginning, has to send an angel. After God already spoke to him, God sends an angel to reassure him. How many How many of that we always asking God for reassurance? God will speak to us. God will do something. And we're constantly asking the Lord, Lord, reassure me. Lord, please just confirm this to me one more time, God. And God is like, I told you yesterday. And God, they told it to you at church. They prophesied it over you. And you're like, well, let me just hear it one more time, Lord. I want to know that I'm protected. I want to know that I'm, but God is so good. He'll reassure us. And I believe that God is reassuring you tonight that you're protected. Amen. God is reassuring you tonight that you are protected. Amen. You are protected at work. And I feel the spirit of God to say that you are protected at work. You are protected amongst your family. You are protected from the economy. You are protected from the government. You are protected from every tactic of the enemy. And rest assured, <laughs> and this is the Lord reassuring you, you are protected. Amen? Because when you abide under the shadows of the Almighty, you are protected. How many can say amen? Amen, amen. It says so here, so when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's camp. So he named that place um, Manan Mananame, meaning double camps. Then Jacob sent messengers ahead of him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the, the county of Edom. He commanded them, saying, This is what um this this is what to say to my Lord Esau. Your servant Jacob says this I've been living temporarily with Laban and have stayed there until now. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, male servants, and female servants. I have sent this to tell my Lord so that I may find grace and kindness in your sight. So basically, Jacob is scared. Have you ever been scared where <laughs> pretty much Jacob is like trying to kiss butt? I'm going to come with donkeys. I'm coming with animals. I'm going to come with, you know, all these gifts. So maybe this person will chill out of trying to come after me. Amen. You, I, I don't want no beef. I don't want no trouble. Let me try to bless them. Let me try to do good deeds. Have you ever been there before? You know, somebody you got beef with or someone who has beef with you. And you're like, let me just try to do nice things because I don't want no drama. I don't want no problems. This is what Jacob is trying to do because he has a little bit of fear there. And it says here, um, uh, we went to your brother Esau. Now he's coming to you to meet you. And there are 400 men with him. So imagine that. Jacob's like, all right, Lord, I'm going to go where you told me. I know my brother's there and he's probably my enemy. And But look what the intimidation factor. There's 400 men waiting. Imagine that. God tells you, hey, go over there, go back here, go do this, go do that. You're like, okay, Lord. And there's four, it's a, a 400 man army waiting for you. <laughs> You're like, God is trying to take me home early. You know, God's trying to kill me. Has anyone ever felt like that before? It's like, man, God is, they like they said, the strongest battles to the strongest soldiers. I feel like the Lord is about to take me out. I feel like the Lord is literally going to put me through a tough test. But check this intimidation factors of the enemy, because look what happens. There's a it says here. There's a 400 men with him. And what happens here? Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. I believe there's a lot of you on here tonight. You feel afraid and distressed. You don't have fear, but you're afraid. Amen. Being afraid is a normal human emotion. Amen. Fear is a spirit. Being afraid is a normal human emotion. Sometimes we're afraid of getting fired, afraid of, you know, this not going working out and, and, and getting distressed because the enemy or life is doing something that intimidates us. And it says here, Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people who were with him and the flocks and herds and camels into two camps. He said, if Esau comes to the one camp and attacks him, then the other camp, which is left, will escape. So, so Jacob has in his mind this whole plot. Hey, if he comes here, we're going to go do this. This person will escape. And I think some of us, we do that. The devil hasn't done anything. <laughs> he hasn't done anything to you yet. And you're like, Planning the worst scenario. If they fire me, I'm going to go here. If they if they don't give me my raise, I'm going to do that. And I'm going to start moving this over here. If this where I'm going to move doesn't work out. You start thinking about all these moving pieces when nothing has happened to you. <laughs> How many ever been there before? Nothing bad has happened to you. You think something is going wrong or you think something may go in the wrong direction. And you're all of a sudden, you're trying to, you're, 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 you're just... 
perfect overthinking things over analyzing you're, you're you're already trying to move pieces around when nothing has happened to you and jacob is doing this why because he's he's afraid and it says here um jacob said oh god of my father abraham and god of my father isaac the lord who said to me return to your country and go to your people i will make you prosper i am unworthy of all loving kindness and compassion and all faithfulness which you have shown to your servant with only my staff I crossed over this Jordan and now I've become blessed and increased into these two groups. Save me, please, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, and that he will come and attack me and my mothers with uh, my and the mothers with the children. And you, Lord, said, I certainly make you prosper and make you descendants as numerous as the sand of the sea, which is too great to be counted. So Jacob spent the night there. Then he selected a present for his brother Esau from the livestock he had acquired: two hundred female goats. Uh, 20 male goats, 200 eels, 20 rams, 30 milk camels with their colts, 40 cows, 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys, 10 uh, donkey colts. He put them into the care of his servants. Every herd by itself and said to his servants, go on ahead of me, put an interval of space between the individual herds. Then he uh, commanded that one in front saying, when Esau, my brother, meets you and ask to whom you belong and where you are going and whose are the animal in front of you, then you shall say they are your servant Jacob's. They are a gift sent to my Lord Esau, and he is also behind us. And so Jacob commanded the second and third as well, and all that followed the herd, saying, This is what you shall say to Esau when you meet him. And you shall say, Look, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he said to himself, I will try to appease him with gift that is going ahead of me then afterward i will see and perhaps he will accept and forgive me so the gift of the herd of the livestock went on ahead of him and he he himself spent that night back in the camp but he got up the same night took his two wives two female servants and his 11 children and waited over the ford of of jabbok then he took them and sent them across the brook and he also sent across whatever he had so look you got jacob like i said over thinking over analyzing uh <laughs> what what god told him hey look it's going to be fine you're going to be you're going to go back you're going to do this and he's letting what things look like intimidate him nothing's happened all he heard was a report of 400 men you have no idea what those 400 men are there for but he's thinking they're coming to kill us that happens to us some something remotely seeming to be inconvenient happens in our life. And we're like, all right, this thing's coming to mess me up. This thing's coming to mess my world up. I'm going to lose. I'm going to lose this. This is going to go wrong in my life. And we allow the enemy to intimidate us as Christians. We must, we must be very difficult to intimidate. Why? Because we need to trust Jesus. When you're intimidated, it comes from is rooted in a, in a form of insecurity that we're insecure about our protection. Amen. When you are easily intimidated, that means you're insecure about your protection. When I when I when I used to fight and I saw a, a, a fighter would be easily intimidated, it's because he started to think of his insecurities. Man, I can't take a punch. What if I get knocked out? I'm not ready. So you know that the person's not prepared. See, when you understand understand this, is that the spirit of God inside of you is always ready. <laughs> you may not, at times may not be ready, but the spirit of God that lives inside of you is always ready. And he's your defender. He is your protector. He is the one that will deflect the darts of the enemy. The Bible says that the Lord, he fights for you. So think about this. If he's fighting for you, that means he's always ready. And then if you know that, and God fights for you, and he lives in you, I don't have nothing to be intimidated about. Amen? I have nothing to be intimidated because I gave my life to him. If God said, I'm going to give you A and B, then he's going to give me A and B. And anything that tries to intimidate me, scare me, make me discouraged, overwhelmed, overthink, overanalyze, is the enemy's tactics. I will not give in. The enemy, those are the enemy's tactics, and you do not give in. Verse 24. Check this out. I think this is very important. It's about to go into a story where Jacob fights with God. 
you notice this. Let's let's read this. Verse 24. So Jacob was left alone and a man, which is it's been the Lord believe it's it's an angel. God came in, in, in as and sent an angel. It says here in the form of a man. It says came and wrestled with him until daybreak. So he was wrestling with Jacob all night. This this man comes and fights with him all night. And it says, when the man saw that he had not prevailed against Jacob, he touched his hip joint and Jacob's hip was dislocated as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go for day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you declare a blessing on me. So this is an angel. This is the Lord, right? And it's, people believe it's an angel, but ultimately it's the Lord. Comes it comes as a, as a man, and Jacob sees this thing and says, "I'm gonna fight with you." Fights with him all night and says, "I'm not letting you go until you bless me." And it says, "So he asked them, what is your name?'" <laughs> and he said, "Jacob." He said, "Your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel." So this is where Jacob's name becomes Israel. That's why the nation today is called Israel, because that is the land that God promised to Jacob. And Jacob's name was changed to Israel. So when he possessed the land, guess what that land's name was called? Israel. That's why you have war today over that land of Israel. You guys see why this is so important, what's going on in the news with Palestine and Israel? Because it is a battle for land that has been happening since the beginning of creation's Genesis. Since the beginning of the Bible, there has been a fight and a dispute over this land. But when you read the Bible and you believe the Bible, you see this land belongs to Jacob or AKA Israel. The land of Palestine did not exist. You had Canaanites, and all kinds of Amalekites, Jebusites, Parasites, all living in this land. But this land belongs to Jacob, who is now, his name is being changed to Israel. Amen. And it says here, you should not be Israel, uh, Jacob, nor but Israel, for you have struggled with God, with, Go. and with men. Go. And have Go. That's why you got rashes. Go. Prevailed. Who was that? Y'all got to stay muted. That just scared me. Anyways, <laughs> um, as, and he says here, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? So you got Jacob there wrestling with God, and he keeps bugging him. Hey, what's your name? What's your name? And he, and, and, and he says, why do you ask him a name? And he declared a blessing. Or here it says the covenant promises on Jacob. So Jacob named the place Peniel, the face of God, saying, for I have seen God face to face, yet my life has not been snatched away. You know, and some will say, but Jamie, doesn't the Bible say that no one has ever seen God's face? God, you're never going to see God the Father in his entirety. He sends it in the, in the form of a manifestation of a man. So he sees, he deals with God, he's dealing with God, but in the form of man. That's why Jesus says, if you've seen me, you, you, you've seen the Father. Amen. He says, if you've seen me, you've seen you've seen the father. And it says here, um, so Jacob, uh, for I've seen God face to face, yet my life has not been snatched away. Now the sun rose on him as he passed, and he was limping because of his hip. Some of y'all have been limping too. And it says here, therefore, to this day, the Israel the Israelites do not eat the tendon of the hip, which is located on the socket of the thigh. Sorry, let me mute my phone. Um, I said they don't eat that part, the socket of the thigh, because he touched the socket of Jacob's thigh by the tendon of his hip. Guys, we need to be more like Jacob. You know what that is? The Lord shows up in the form of a man in his tendon. What's the first thing reaction? I'm going to fight with this man until God blesses me, and I'm not going to let go to the point that the, this man or angel had to dislocate his hip to get him to stop. <laughs> 
I think we need to become that way with the, with 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 our life. Say, I'm gonna fight for my blessing. I'm gonna fight for this promise of God. I'm going to fight for my walk with the Lord. I'm gonna fight for my family. I'm gonna fight for my breakthrough. I don't care if it dislocates my hip like Jacob. I am going to fight, and I'm gonna get my blessing. You need to be this way. The Bible says that the kingdom of God suffers violence, but the violent take it by force. This is what Jacob did. He was violent. But see, one thing we need to learn, uh, not learn from Jacob, but learn from what happened to him. It's crazy. Esau, it, 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 his brother, has arm. he's scared. We're scared of the enemy, but then we get mad at God. We want to fight with God, but don't fight the enemy. Isn't that crazy? He has all the courage to get mad at God, fight with God, go at it with God. But when it comes to his enemies and when it comes to uh, what's going on in, in his life with people, you're scared. I know a lot of Christians like that. You fight with the Lord, be mad at God, say God ain't do this, God ain't do that with no fear whatsoever. But let the devil do one little thing to you and you're scared. <laughs> Has anyone ever been like that? You'll get mad at God. You'll argue with God. You'll demand things from God. God hasn't done this. God hasn't done that. Why hasn't God answered my prayer and this and that? But then, you know, the enemy does something. You won't fight him, though. <laughs> you won't put him in his place. And look, Jacob was doing that. But nonetheless, he fought and he won. Amen. As Christians, we got to be fighters. You got to say, I'm going to fight for my blessing. I'm going to fight. I'm going to fight for what God is going to do in my life because it's a fight. Why? Because... The Bible says this is the fight of faith. The devil's going to try to fight you. But the best thing is, is that you're not fighting alone. I say this all the time. When the devil tries to fight you, he's not fighting. He's not just fighting you. He's going to have to fight the Lord, the angels, the church, everybody. <laughs> Amen. That's why you got to stay in fellowship with the Lord. Stay in fellowship with a church. So when the devil tries to fight you, he's not just fighting you. Amen. Guys, I... I, I it's it's all I like what Josh Joshua said. A whole squad, amen. I I pray for you guys. I fight for you guys. Me and my wife, we we spend time um interceding with you guys for you guys all the time. But I think about you guys, even though I don't want to. <laughs> I'll be at work sometimes, and and the Lord will speak to me and show me things about you guys, and I'm I, I'm 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 praying for you guys. Um, because that's what a pastor is supposed to be. And, 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 and as you guys, as a congregation, you should be like that as well. You should think, man, how's, how's, how's Justin doing? How's Tia doing? How's, man, I'm gonna pray for them. You got to pray for your brethren. Amen. If you're on here tonight and you don't pray for nobody in the church, only yourself, man, you're disconnected from the body of Christ. You need to be praying for one another. And, and that would be the enemy has to deal with everything. Imagine the devil's coming after you, but he can't because Michalina's praying for you, Furman's praying for you, Brenda's praying for you, Connie's praying for you, Christ, uh, Pastor Crystal's praying for you. Every, it's, it's, it's like, man, I'm getting ganged up on. So you, this, this is so important. And as Christians, we got to stop being soft. The devil's not soft with you. Amen? How many can say amen to that? The devil's not soft with you. You think he takes it easy on you when he wants to attack you, when he wants to tempt you, when he wants to discourage you? He doesn't go easy on you. He tries to hit you with everything he's got. So because he's going to try to hit me with everything he's got, I best you better believe I'm going to hit him with everything I got. And not everything, well, not just everything I got, but everything God's got, everything his words got, everything the church got, everything my pastor got, we're going to hit him with all of that. And when the devil sees that, you don't want none of that. But you know what the devil wants? An isolated Christian, one roaming around by himself, one that doesn't really go to church, one that's disconnected, one that's isolated, because he says, okay, this is a lone wolf. There's no pack here. That's why it's important. But we got to be violent. Say, man, this is my blessing. Amen. And I feel it to say this because I believe, you know, some of you guys, I'm telling you guys, didn't believe when I said that this is the year of vindication this year. 2024 is a year where I believe God is going to vindicate his people. He's going to correct things that the enemy has done, had these governments have done, people have done, the wickedness, the things of people that has done. It's going to be 
corrected in 2024. I don't know if y'all been seeing, but I said this. I This was the word of the Lord. I said wickedness is going to be dealt with. There's going When God's going to deal with wickedness, he exposes it and, and, and he does it. And he brings it out to the light to deal with things. And starting this year, so many famous preachers have been getting exposed. Have y'all been seeing that? Big generals in the faith are getting exposed, exposed because wickedness is being dealt with. I prophesied this. Wickedness is being dealt with. Make sure you are on the right side. People's wicked agendas against you is going to be exposed. People that have done unfair, unjust have slandered your name, have done wrong to you, have spoken negatively about you, have falsely accused you, they will be dealt with. Amen? We need to believe that. And we need to fight for that. And we need to stick with that. Amen? Because if that's what God has said, it's going to happen. There's so many preachers getting exposed now. T.D. Jakes is, I mean, the, the main one. Now there's a documentary on T.B. Joshua, who was a big, I mean, he just passed away not too long ago. But he was a big deliverance prophetic guy. And now they're going into his life that this guy had a complete double life and horrible, horrible testimony. So make sure you're on the right side of this. But, you know, like I said, the enemy is trying everything he can to make sure you don't get to the next level. You need to be like Jacob that you say, man, I don't care if I'm limping. <laughs> I'm getting my blessing. I don't care if I have to limp to my destiny. I'm going to get there. I don't care if I have to limp to my new house that I'm believing God for. I'm going to get there. And I'm a, if I got to get there limping, I'll get there limping. If I got to get to whatever it is, that the next that destiny, that promise, that blessing that you, you're you waiting on. If you got to get there limping, then get there limping, but you're going to get there. Amen. All right, let's go to chapter 33. Jacob meets Esau. So he's intimidated. Gets scared, wrestles with God. God blesses him. And now he's going to go deal with Esau. Then Jacob looked up. He saw Esau coming with 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two maids. Once again, he's getting scared, <laughs> spreading the people out. And it says, he put the maids and their children in the front, Leah and her children after them, and Rachel and Joseph last of all. Uh, then Jacob crossed over the stream ahead of them and bowed himself to the ground seven times, bowing and moving forward each time until he approached his brother. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him, hugged his neck and kissed him, and they wept for joy. When I read that, I was laughing. I'm like, this dude was terrified, scared. He sees 400 men. He thinks it's over for him. He's he's putting all his people where he thinks they need to be preparing for this big attack just to find out the enemy was going to do nothing. And I think that's what's going to happen. This is going on with some of you guys. You're scared. You're doing my job, this, my, my family, that, this sickness here, just to find out nothing is going to happen. <laughs> this is why you can't give in to fear. You know what fear is? Being afraid of a future that does not exist. That's what fear is. You're believing in a future that does a negative outcome that, that does not exist. He's like, man, I'm, he's getting ready for Esau to kill him and his family. Just to find out Esau comes hugging him and crying happy with joy. Sometimes we get we let the enemy scare us, intimidate us, make us think the worst is going to happen just to later find out everything's fine. Has anyone been there before? You're like, oh, my gosh. You know, <laughs> your boss sends you a text message. We need to talk. And you're scared. Oh, my gosh, they're going to they're going to fire me. They're going to this you know, to just to later find out he pulls you in and gives you a raise. <laughs> you're like, and this whole time I was terrified. You know, this whole time I thought something bad was going to happen. And we let the devil intimidate. Don't let him intimidate you. Amen. And it says Esau looked up and saw the woman and the children said, who are these with you? So Jacob replied, they are the children whom God has graciously given your servant. Then the maids approached with their children, they bowed down. Leah also approached with her children. They bowed down. Afterward, Joseph and Rachel approached and they bowed down. And Esau asked, what do you mean by all this company which I have met? He answered, um, these are to find favor in the sight of my Lord. But Esau said, I have plenty, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. Jacob replied, no, please. If now I have found favor in your sight, then accept my gift as a blessing from my hand. 
For I see your face as if I had seen the face of God and you have received me favorably. Please accept my blessing, which has been brought to you. For God has dealt graciously with me and I have everything that I could possibly want. So Jacob kept urging him. Then Esau accepted it. Then Esau said, let us get started on our journey. And I will go in front of you to lead the way. But Jacob replied, you know, my Lord, that the children are frail and need gentle care and the nursing flock and herds are of concern to me. For if the men should drive them hard for a single day, all the flock will die. Please let my Lord go on ahead of his servant. I will move slowly, governed by the pace of the livestock that are in front of me and according to the endurance of the children until I come to my Lord in Seir in Adam. Then Esau said, please let me leave with you some of the people who are with me. But Jacob said, what need is there for it? Let me find favor in the sight of my Lord. So Esau turned back to the south that day on his way to, to Seir. But Jacob journeyed north to Sukkoth, built himself a house, and made shelters for his livestock. So the name of the place is Sukkoth, or Hut's Shelters. When Jacob came uh, from Pad Aram, he arrived safely and in peace in the city of Shechem in the land of Canaan, the, which the land of Canaan is modern-day Palestine. And it says here, and camped in front of the city. Then he bought the piece of the land on which he had pitched in his tents from the sons of Hamer, Shechem, father for a hundred pieces of money there he erected an altar and called the el elohe israel so he bought the land that is quote unquote palestine so you know that that does not belong to nobody else uh chapter 34 now dina the daughter of leah which is jacob's daughter whom she had born to jacob went out uh, unescorted to visit the girls of the land. When Shishem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite prince of the land, saw her, he kidnapped her, and uh, he laid with her by force, in other words, raping her, um, and humbling and offending her. But this uh, soul longed for and clung to Dina, a uh, daughter of Jacob, and he loved the girl and spoke comfortingly to her, young heart's wishes. So Shishem said to his father, get me this young woman as a wife. So he rapes her, gets obsessed with her and wants to make her his wife. I say, so now Jacob heard that Shishem had violated Dina, his daughter, but his sons were in the field with his livestock. So Jacob said nothing until they came in. But Shishem father, Hamor went to Jacob to talk with him. Now, when Jacob's son heard of it, they came into the field. They were deeply grieved and they were very angry for Shishem had done a disgraceful thing uh, to Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter for such a thing is not to be done. But Hamor conferred with them, saying, the soul of my son Shechem um, longs for your daughter. Please give her to him as his wife. And beyond that, intermarry with us. Give your daughters to us as wives and take our daughters for yourselves. In this way, you shall live with us. The country will be open to you. Live and do business in it, and acquire property and possessions in it. Shechem also said to Dina's father and to her brothers, Let me find favor in your sight, and I will give you whatever you ask of me. Demand of me very large bridal payment and gift as compensation for giving up your daughter and sister, and I will give you whatever you tell me. Only give me the girl to be my wife. Man, this guy was desperate. <laughs> this guy was going up really out of his way for this girl. And it says here, Jacob's sons answer Shechem and Hamor and his father deceitfully, because Shechem had defiled and disgraced their sister Dina. They said to them, we cannot do this thing and give our sister marriage to one who is not circumcised, because that would be a disgrace to us. But we will consent with you only in this condition. If you will be like us and, and that every male among you consents to be circumcised, then we'll give your daughters to you in marriage and we'll take your daughters for ourselves and we will live with them and become one people. So if you notice this, have you noticed that Jacob has a very slick behavior? He knows how to pull fast ones on people. He pulled a fast one on Esau multiple times. He's constantly pulling fast ones. Why do you think the Bible says to be as soft as doves and wise as serpents? <laughs> because we're Israelites. And who's the founder in the beginning and the father of is uh, Israel, which is Jacob? And he's like this. <laughs> And it says here, but if you do not listen to us and refuse to be circumcised, then we will take our daughter Dina and go. Their words seemed reasonable to Hamor and his son Shechem, and the young man did not hesitate to do the thing, for he was delighted with Jacob's daughter. Now he was more respected and honored than all in the household of his father. Then Hamor and Shechem, his son, came to the gate 
of the city where they're leading Mechami and spoke with the men of the city saying, these men are peaceful, friendly with us. So let them live in the land and do business in it for the land is large enough for us. And for them, let us take their daughter for wives. Let us give them our daughters in marriage, but only on this condition will the men consent to our request that they will live among us and become one people that every male among us being become circumcised just as they are circumcised. Will not their cattle and their possession, all their animals be ours if we do this? Let us consent to, to do as they ask, and if they will live here with us. And every Canaanite man who um, went out of the city gate listened and considered that Hamor Shechem said, and every male who was a resident of that city circumcised. Now on the third day after circumcision, when all the men were terribly sore and in pain. <laughs> When I read that verse, man, I laughed so hard. I was like, Jacob is so slick. He knew what he was doing. Amen. That's why I said, you got to be violent. The devil's violent. You got to be slick. The devil is slick. He got it. You got to be wise. So, so Jacob's like, all right, you raped my daughter. You think you're going to make a deal with me. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to make these men go get circumcised, make them think we're about to make a deal. And then look what, look what he does. Look what he does. When I, when I, when I read that first verse, I said, oh man, you can already, you can already tell what, what Jacob is about to do. It says here, now on the third day, when all the men were terribly sore and in pain, two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, uh, their, uh, Dina's brothers took their swords, boldly entered the city Without anyone suspect them of their evil intent, they killed every single male. They killed Hamor, his son, Shechem, with the edge of the sword, took Dina out of Shechem's house where she was staying, and left. Then Jacob's other sons came upon who were killed and looted the town because their sister had been defiled and disgraced. They took the Canaanites' flocks and their, their herds and their donkeys and whatever was in the city and in the field. They looted all their wealth took captive all their children, their wives, took everything that was in their houses. Jacob said to Simeon and to Levi, you have ruined me, making me a stench to the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. My men are few in number, and the men of the land will band together against me and attack me. I shall be destroyed, I and my household. But they said, but they said, should he be permitted to treat our sister as a prostitute? So this is important because have you ever met somebody, they'll say, you know, you know, God justifies when, you know, somebody kills and gets kills a whole town and does this. Who were they doing this to? To Canaanites. Canaanites. When people will grab one section of the Bible and will say, well, see, what kind of God is that? They went and killed and did all this and blah, blah, blah. You, you grab one thing and you don't read it in context. These people, if you read about Canaanites... They were not good people. Canaanites were wicked people. They were murderers. They were rapists. Look at it. <laughs> you were seeing it. They're rapists and stuff. These were not. It was a whole community of people. This is not the first battle and encounter that Israelites have with Canaanites. It happens throughout the whole Bible. They have issues with these. And in the, every single time, these people are wicked. God deals with wickedness. Remember I said this, 2024, God is going to deal with wickedness. Look, the unjust thing that, wow, look, once again, God is confirming through this Bible study, this is not planned. Once again, the word of the Lord for 2024, the unjust things that were done to you will be dealt with. The unfair things that has happened to you is going to be dealt with. The wickedness of people will be dealt with. That's why I said, man, it's praise God that we're in the Lord, that if we've ever done or anything wicked, we can repent, come before Christ, be washed, be made clean. We're good to hope. We're good to go. It's going to be corrected. It's going to be corrected. Amen? Let's see. All right, let's do one more chapter. We'll do one more chapter. Chapter 35. Then God said to Jacob, go up to Bethel, live there, make an altar there to God who appeared to you 
in a in a distinct manifestation. So once again, the man that showed up in the tent to uh, fight with Jacob was God manifested in the flesh. Do you see a, a pattern here in the Old Testament? Has anyone noticed the pattern since we started reading Genesis? God likes to manifest himself all the time. All the time. Melchizedek was Jesus manifesting himself. When 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 Abraham and, and, and Lot were gonna see Sodom and Gomorrah get destroyed, they dealt with the they dealt with the Lord manifesting himself as a man. Jacob deals with God manifesting himself as a man in his tent. I think I'm gonna end right here, actually. This is so so important. God desires to manifest himself in your life as much as possible. Think about this. People think that the only time God ever came and you know manifest himself in the flesh is with, G with the you know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus. He manifested himself here. Look what it says here in the Amplified Version. It says, who appeared to you in a distinct manifestation when Moses saw the burning bush. That was God manifesting himself in a burning bush. So you notice the pattern with Jesus, with the Lord, with Jesus. He loves to manifest himself. What does it mean to manifest? To reveal himself to his people. Amen. God desires to continue to reveal himself his plans, his desires, his promises, and his word in your life. And I think we need to start really letting that marinate in our mind that God desires to reveal himself, manifest himself in your life as much as possible. How many, how many could say amen to that? How many want to see more of God's manifesting in your life. I'm telling you, God, if you desire to see more of God, he will. See, the thing is with God is, you know, people think of, of God as distant, not, not listening to you, not talking to you. You pray and, and you don't really hear from him. That's not the God that I know. That's not the God of this Bible. God desires to manifest himself, reveal himself as much as possible to you because he loves you. He wants to comfort you. He wants to defend you. He loves you. Isn't that crazy? Jesus is, he's our, he's not just our Lord and our savior. He's our, the lover of our soul. He is quote unquote, he's our husband. I know some men are going to be like, what? He is our, we're the bride of Christ. He desires to reveal himself. So when you read this in Genesis, how many times has God come in the flesh, has come as a person, has sent an angel, has sent somebody, and it's been him the whole time. But if you notice, when God comes, sometimes he comes as something you may not think is him. Imagine that you're sleeping in a tent and a man comes in your tent. Most of you are not thinking, oh, that's the Lord visiting me. Some of you guys, you go get the gun. Go get the strap. <laughs> you know, somebody, you're out there camping with your family and somebody gets in a tent. You, the last thing you're thinking, that's the Lord coming in there, you know, trying to hang out with you in the middle of the night. But that's God. God will sometimes manifest himself in ways in your life that you have no idea. You have no idea. God will reveal himself so many times. And so there's sometimes God will, will, will be there and you won't even notice it. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? God will sometimes come in and manifest himself and be in your life under the radar. And you don't even know it. When Jesus was crucified and everybody thought he was dead, they said there was two men walking down the road, sad. And, and, and it says a man appeared to them and said, why are you guys so sad? They're like, oh, because, you know, the Messiah, this guy, Christ, you know, he died and he was supposed to be here. And then he told them, don't be sad. And they were just to later find out it was Jesus walking with him saying, why are you being sad? I'm right here. So sometimes 
We think the Lord's not there. Some of you, you think God's not with me. You think God's not at your job. You don't think he's in your finances. You don't think he's He's in your future. You don't think he's with you right now. I'm here to tell you right now, as you're wherever you're at right now, laying in your bed, on your couch, or in your car, whatever it is you're doing, I'm here to tell you Jesus is right there with you, desiring to manifest himself, desiring to reveal himself, desiring to show himself to you. God's not trying to hide himself to you. He's not trying to be, a, he wants to reveal himself. Amen. Got to seek him out. Got to pay attention and realize that God is there. That God loves you and he's with you and he's revealing himself to you. But don't be like, man, if there's one thing that you're going to learn from tonight in the tonight's Bible study, be like Jacob, be aggressive for, for the kingdom of God, the things of God, that what God speaks and what God says. And don't let the enemy intimidate you because you might just find out <laughs> your enemy just wants to give you a hug. He, he didn't want, didn't really want, he didn't really want no smoke with you. Amen. So I think this is so important for tonight. Amen. Don't let the enemy intim intimidate you. If you're going to be like Jacob, fight. This year, 2024, you fight for what God has said, what God has spoken, what God has promised. You say, I'm going to fight. Like I said, even if it means me limping, but I'm going to get to, I'm going to get to where God has told me to go, what he has for me, and that I know he desires to reveal himself to me. So I challenge you guys the rest of this week. Ask the Lord. Think about it. When was the last time you asked the Lord, reveal yourself to me, Lord? Manifest yourself in my life. When was the last time you asked the Lord to do that? Say, Lord, manifest yourself in my life. Manifest yourself in this area of my life. Reveal yourself to me. Reveal more of yourself and your word to me. Things ain't going to get revealed and manifest unless you seek him. Seek him. Because God desires to manifest himself in every aspect of your life to know you, to let you know he's there in every little thing that has to do with you. Isn't that crazy? Every little thing that has to do with you, God desires to be manifested in that. But the problem with some of us, we're manifesting too many other things. So that's why God, you know, when God doesn't manifest himself in an area of your life, when something else is manifesting in that place, God's not going to manifest himself when you're letting demons manifest through your life. He's not going to manifest if you're letting your bad character manifest itself. He's going to, you're going to have a hard time letting God manifest himself when you're letting fear and doubt and worry and all these things manifest itself. But the good thing is, is if it, those things do manifest itself, get set free so God can manifest itself in your life. What is manifest when things get revealed and get exposed? There's going to be a lot of that this year. It's going to be a lot of that this year. It started in 2023 and it's going to continue in 2024. Make sure you're on the right side of that. Make sure that you're the ones that you're like, if God exposes me, it's so that I love the Lord. Amen. I show you on the right side of that. Amen. Hey, man. God is good.